What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to yet another interview. I am Mike Linden. I'm so excited to bring to you today's guest. Of course, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe to the My Radar YouTube channel. We have interviews like this and educational science content coming all of the time. Be sure to click on that notification bell. That way you always know whenever we drop a new video. So my guest today is somebody you may have seen featured across the My Radar world. I'm so excited to bring in our guest today. And boy, she has a ton of titles. She is a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She was the Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration. She's a CNN National Security Analyst, a correspondent for MyRadar, and of course, an author as well. Julia Kayyem, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Mike. Of course. So we wanted to talk to you, of course, about a really special day coming up, March 29th, the release of your book titled The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. So, of course, you are a risk management disaster expert. When you were putting this book together here, I mean, there was it, when I was reading it, there was so much yeah. that you covered from Sully, solar winds, Y2K, COVID, even to Chipotle's E. coli incident. How did you fit so so much right. into that book. Well, the, the thank you so much, and it's it's uh, it's so great to be with you, and grateful to my radar and Andy and you and everyone for all your support because we're we're all we're all in the same world, right? It's uh, um, of uh, disaster management and risk mitigation. I have been thinking of a book like this for a long time. I think COVID uh, maybe both gave me the time and the uh, to reflect and also write, and it really was um, a, basically. It was to take away the surprise out of disaster management. Most people do not know that the word disaster uh, actually is dis for not or bad, and aster is meaning sort of a, uh, alignment of the stars. So it's so we've always viewed disasters. Uh, we're still beholden to this definition as some sort of surprise or shock, something that we sort of can't control. And disaster management has been framed around that belief that it's something unexpected and unanticipated. And I mean, you know as well as I, whether it's climate or cyber or pandemics or terrorism or you name it, uh, that the devil never sleeps, right? That that these are we're in an age of recurring disasters, and how should that change the way we think about disaster management and honestly how we measure success? Because we really we really can't measure success simply by did we stop the bad thing from happening, but whether the investments we've made have minimized the harm that is that is going to come to these. Uh, communities and families and and nations. And so um, when you talk about the sweep of disasters, what I did is I took a step back and said, you know, instead of viewing each of these as individual, right? Oh, this happened in paradise and this happened at Chipotle and this happened at Boeing. What are sort of the common themes about both what went wrong, but also what went right that can help guide people through uh, the, the years, unfortunately, decades, maybe centuries ahead? So what about disasters and yeah. crisis management attracted you? Why did you want to get into that field to, 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 to help people or to yeah. prevent these things from happening? It's funny because I actually, um, uh, my career started off, just think about how um, uh, insular it was. I started off as a uh, as a as an attorney at the Department of Justice who got into counterterrorism. This is before 9/11, so I was involved with counterterrorism cases. Very very discreet field at the time, and then of course 9/11 happens, and you know I'm in government, and then serving on a commission, and then in academia, and really focused on essentially this what we call left of boom, right? Which is you know how do you stop the bad thing from happening? The boom can be generic. And like many people in my field, and I thought about really from the Homeland Security perspective, it's defensive. It is, so how do we stop essentially 19 guys from getting on four airplanes? Uh, that changed, my interest changed after Hurricane Katrina, which was really, gosh, we're so focused on, you know, stopping this bad thing from happening. We haven't nurtured our capacity for what you, you learn in the book is the sort of right of boom capacity, which is after the bad thing, what what we, what do we wish we had done at that moment that would have minimized the harm? Uh, and so over the last 15 years, I guess it has been really focused on on sort of nurturing those preparedness capabilities 
uh, against a narrative, as you certainly know from media, that, you know, that, that, you know, it's sort of a never again narrative, right? Like, oh, that can't happen again. Why does this keep happening? Well, it kind of keeps happening. And so that's how I got interested in it. And the title of the book, I should say, comes from, I think, you know, you have these light bulb moments in your careers. It comes from a visit that I made to Joplin, Missouri, a year after the tornado that devastated that community. I've been with you recently about tornadoes. We know tornadoes are uh, are sometimes are, are so horrific because of the lack of ability to warn against them in many ways and how quick they are. And Joplin had lost over a hundred people, a small community in Missouri. And I went back at the year anniversary and uh, and was talking to a woman who had sort of become the the lead in her uh, in in rebuilding and reimagining in many ways um, uh, 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 Joplin and. Uh, she's very upbeat and, you know, very, very faith based and, you know, sort of and I, I'm trying to figure out, like, how, how do you get that way? You know, how do you get so upbeat after moments of gloom and doom? And she said, uh, the devil never sleeps. He only wins if we don't do better next time. And it was a it was a faith that was very tactical. It was sort of an understanding that tornadoes would happen again. And and wh- how did sh- how should we focus our efforts um, and be optimistic about our capacity to, assert, I say, assert agency uh, in the uh, in the book. And so that has really sort of flavored what I do in academia, you know, back in government eventually uh, when I did it on, uh, in media on platforms like this. And, and also my advising, which I tell some of those stories for the private sector um, uh, and in terms of thinking about uh, the kind of preparedness that we would want because the devil uh, always returns, and I'll do a I'll do a quick plug to my radar. This is what we started to do before COVID, and hope to do again in the series that we had, the digital series about returning to these communities after something bad happens, because all the media leaves by then. It's like, how are they rethinking if they should, uh, given climate change, their recovery, knowing in the case of paradise, for example, that fires will come again, or in the case of uh, the Bahamas, that that hurricanes will come again. I loved the story that you started the book off with finding the photo in your house. I mean, it's just stranger than fiction that a risk management expert is living in the home where there was a disaster, so to speak, that struck, I mean, right where you live a a while ago, of course. Can you elaborate more on finding that photo? That's just like a real life treasure hunt. We all, you know, you look back at the last two years and all these sort of weird moments. And, uh, you know, for me professionally, it was such a strange year, 2020, because everything stopped. I wasn't traveling anywhere, and I'm on the road almost all the time for my work. Uh, but um, uh, but I was very busy because I was helping institutions and private sector and and mayors and governors about sort of you know about planning for COVID. I'm a I, you know, I, 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 I'm a consumer of intelligence. I'm not a doctor, but sort of how should they be thinking about this disaster? Because once again. There's commonalities amongst all disasters. COVID might be uh, uh, novel, but it's not new, right? It's just it's just a disaster, so to speak. So I'm home, and just you know, very quickly, we we sort of have an accident in the boys' be- a bathroom where the ceiling comes down. Uh, in it, we find a crawl space. We've t- been told that there was crawl space, but it was significantly bigger than crawl space. I live in a very old house uh, in Cambridge. It was built in the 1840s in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and in this crawl space, my, uh, we found one picture uh, and it was just of a man by a drape sort of sitting, he was dressed up as people did in pictures at that time. I put it on Twitter uh, and fast forward. And what we learned because Twitter is amazing, these genealogists are amazing, is that uh, it's the, it's a, the, the, uh, that the McHugh family had lived here uh, during the, uh, what we now know, call the Spanish influenza, but um, uh, the great flu. Uh, in uh, 1917 to 1919, they lived here. Uh, and they had a daughter who, in the third wave of the Spanish flu, uh, got uh, uh, got sick. They had put her up in what's called the sort of infirmary room. These are rooms that existed in houses. Uh, it's like, you know, I, I, I don't want to th- people to think that there's a room in my house I didn't know about. It's, it's narrow and about four feet tall, but uh, she went up there. She ended up dying. She was 19 years old, uh, and they must have had brought pictures up to her to keep her company uh, and uh, to isolate her. 
and uh, and uh, she died in the house. Uh, the funeral was here. The body was here. There was a pretty well known family, the McHughes. They moved out that year. Uh, then it went to a variety of owners until it came to us. And it was that um, circular, sort of that, both that sort of horror, right? I mean, this is my house. I have a 19 year old daughter, you know, the horror of the third wave of a pandemic, sort of as we are experiencing now that these things come in waves and people still um, uh, uh, die in the first, you know, in the second and third, if not fourth waves. Uh, the the fears of a mother like I was because my kids were all home. I had two who had who I had three. I have three kids. One returned from college. Two were doing high school uh, remotely. But also just the irony of that my work uh, sort of rebounded in the walls of my own home. But it was very consistent with what I ha was thinking at the time. I think that sort of generated me to sit down and start or motivated me to sit down and start writing the book, which was. Um, which is that that connectivity over the century, uh, 1919 to 2020, over the century in, in a house that I'm in right now of of, of a devil's return, right? It's, you know, the, the, that time it was uh, the Spanish flu. This time it's it's COVID, and that story really did make me uh, think about um, the futility, which you often hear people complain about, but the futility of imagining a world of uh, unicorns and rainbows. It, and and I'm a pretty optimistic person, as you know, it's not that I'm fatalistic, it's just, you know, there's a there's a brutal realism to, to, to recognizing uh, these cycles, but it's also, it, that realism should also uh, empower us rather than constantly being, you know, waiting for the stars to misalign. If that's, you know, we know that's not true. We know that we know that disasters happen for a variety of reasons. Some of them flukes and some of them be, uh, our own fault. I was hooked right away after, after that story, and it was just a, a wild ride through, through the rest Thanks. of the book there. One of the lines that really like gave me goosebumps was at one point you say, there is no finish line, yeah. that the devil or the boom is going to come back again and again. And that seems to be the standard operating procedure or the SOP. I learned a lot of acronyms yeah. reading, <laughs> reading your book. <laughs> is, is this an unfortunate inevitability of civilization that that yeah. this boom that the that the devil is just going to keep coming back no matter what we do yes i think it is and i i actually think the, the purpose of the book was to reframe an entire field i hope i can help do that there's others who are doing tremendous work in the same um not to get too wonky but i am a professor but in disaster management uh the the um it's described as uh, 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 most most research of disasters have always focused on the disaster as being day zero or day one. Excuse me. That, that, OK, there's no history. There's no lessons learned. It's just like a bad thing happens. And then, you know, we'll see what happens. And and uh, history was essentially written out of the way we thought about disasters. We're getting acclimated now more to it uh, now. So, you know, it's it's it's. You know, Hurricane Katrina is a hurricane, right? In in 2005. Well, that's not true. I mean, it's 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 a it's a hurricane that accumulated from uh you know and hit a city that uh, was the center of the slave trade, and then when that ends, you know uh, you know it becomes isolated and segregated and corrupt. Uh, and uh, and builds knowing that it's building in a bathtub, essentially, anyone who knows the geography of, of New Orleans. So the idea that there's no history is just uh, is something to be written into these disasters. And that's why I do a lot of historical disasters to, to do that connectivity. When I say there's no finish line, part of it is a, just a, 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 a um, is, is a, you know, my, my honesty, which is we all know it. It's just everyone's afraid to say it, right? Like, it's like, we, we know it. We know it intuitively. Uh, and we talk about a new normal after COVID. Well, that's, you know, I don't even know what that means because that assumes that's a, a, a place. It's, it's not a place. We're, we're going to be constantly dealing with, if not viruses, then climate change or cyber attacks or terrorism. And, and, uh, and so constantly have to be adapting our preparedness against uh, against a, a, I don't criticize it, but it's just against a sort of the human desire for 
uh, for normalcy, right? Which is, you know, or for, you know, we're back, right? And that's that's a, not a bad attitude, but I'm, I'm here to remind you that you're only back for so long and then something else will happen. Uh, and what, what skills do we wish we had? What investments, what policies, what, as you say, standard operating procedures do we want? Because we should treat disasters as the norm. And once you treat them as the norm, they become less terrifying and less surprising, right? And that's the, that's the goal, to rethink how we have defined disaster management. Another acronym that I picked up from reading your book, WTW, what's the word? Are, are these acronyms, are these acronyms for pros, like behind the scenes, such as yourself? Or do you think that taking uh, risk management disasters and kind of compartmentalizing it a little bit into these easy to remember acronyms yeah. will help down the line? I think so. I've always had a goal. I do. I try to do this on CNN for those who watch me with, with you all, which is, which is my field. A lot of people get uh, famous, right, or, or uh, 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 get audiences uh, by terrifying, right? In other words, and I have a line in the book, it says, you know, people people in my field uh, talk to the American power, talk to the public, any public, in a way that either, that gives them only two options, tune out or freak out, right? Those are the only two options. And my goal has always been that uh, the American public can handle this, right? Or the public can handle this, but that we're not, we're not treating this and describing it in a way that's accessible because we do use those terms and those acronyms and, and make it all so heady and difficult and super squirrely and secret. So uh, uh, someone who read the book, who reviewed the book, described it as chatty and it was a compliment and I take it as a compliment. My goal for people who are like, oh, I never would read a book about disaster management is, is really uh, you know, this is this is a user friendly uh, opening of the curtain of what's right and wrong with disaster management. How does it work now and how should how should it work in an age of disasters? How should we change it? So acronyms like go be, you know, general officer, bright idea or situational awareness. I give a wonky explanation of that. Uh, and WTW was what's the word, although I should admit that one came from my son, uh, as I described, <laughs> I do have personal anecdotes in it, but, um, anyone who has teenagers, you'll ask them at say 7 PM, are you going out tonight? And they'll say, I don't know. And then at 7.05, they go, okay, I'm meeting friends here. And you're like, what happened in that five minutes, right? The rest of us are like, you know, begging for plans. <laughs> and apparently with teenagers, they, they go on their texts or whatever, WhatsApp, I don't even know what they're on. And they just do WTW, what's the word? Like, where are you all? And then all of a sudden my son knew where to go. So I thought that that was hilarious, but it actually applies to, in that chapter is really about um, situational awareness. You know this, Michael, because you guys try, you, you, you cover these things in real time. One of the biggest challenges in uh, crisis and disaster management is, is what we call situational awareness, which is what's happening now to guide what we need for, t what we need for tomorrow. And it's harder than it looks. Disasters are chaotic by definition. Uh, so how can we get better ways to, to, uh, to understand what's going on so that we can drive resources and then explain to people what they need to do? And, and you know, not to praise you all, but I think that's what platforms like yours are trying to do as well, which is we've got to take the fear out of this because it's only through um, agency, which I, you know, which, which I'm a big, big fan of. It's only through sort of you know, agency. Yes, we can do this, right? It's going to be horrible and people will die, but fewer people will die because of our investment in preparing for the devil's return. And that's, that's a, I think, a common theme by many of us in this field now, which is, uh, you know, minimizing the consequences of the harms that are surely to come. And with that understanding and situational awareness, yeah. being able to read the room, so to speak, That's right. um, it, it seems like one of the big pillars in your book is accepting failure. When the risks yeah. become too great, it's it's just at a point where it's at better. It seems like it's better for everybody to to accept that and to move forward from that. Was that difficult for you in yeah. your field to accept that as a reality that failure was going to be built? Obviously, you want to do a, a great job with everything that you're right. doing, but failure seems to be really important in risk management, mitigation, and resiliency. Right. That's exactly right. So, and failure defined in two ways. I mean, one is, well, I, I would turn it a little bit, which is 
the, the challenge of defining success when bad things have already happened. And, and so, you know, 800,000 Americans dead because of COVID, right? Well, compared to 50,000 dead, which would have been, you wouldn't have viewed the 50,000 dead as a success, but compared to our failures in preparedness, which led to 800,000 dead, 50,000 would look good. It's a very hard thing for people to get their heads around. I'm not praising 50,000 deaths. I'm just saying that that difference is how we begin. We should begin to, to measure success because if we had done our preparedness right, there would have been losses to COVID. Every country, whether successful or not successful, has had deaths. It is just there would be fewer. But the other piece that you're alluding to, and I, and this, and I write about our trip to, to paradise uh, uh, that I did for my radar, which is knowing that the devil's returning. So thinking about fires, um, uh, there will be moments, and this is not always feasible, in which what we call managed retreat becomes uh, the, the best uh, action against the devil. I mean, in other words, in which you just concede defeat before he comes again. And I think that's really true in terms of coastal building, in terms of the wildland uh, urban interface, you know, in terms of what we call WUI, uh, in terms of uh, building in areas that are going to continually have fires. I, I will say what that paradise trip we did was so illuminating, becomes a part of one of the chapters because it also showed, once again, agency or the ingenuity of, of humans, right? We're not zombies, as I say. You know, we actually can respond uh, to living with the fire. What have we learned from all these fires? Well, you actually can build better. You can uh, uh, widen infrastructure and roads. You can, you can survive fires better. Now, the existential question whether we should build in those areas, but certainly if we do build, we can build better. And I think that's a lesson for everyone. And I should say, you know, in some instances, because this isn't just about climate change, it's about, the, I'm very agnostic about the devil. I call it the boom or the devil. Like, this is how we think about it. It's what we call all hazards, another another uh, terminology in my field. But it's like, what, what bad thing could happen? In some instances, we don't have the option to retreat, right? I mean, in other words, we, 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 you, you can't bring down our uh, connectivity and protect ourselves perfectly from cyber attacks. So we do have to think about, okay, I need, I need to have my wires flow. I need things to be connected. What will we do uh, after the breach? And uh, I'm pretty critical of the cybersecurity world in terms of them planning through what would be the consequences of a breach. Another big uh, acronym in, in your book yeah. here, the Incident Command System, yeah. the ICS, used in both the public and private sector, a flowchart uh, right. for, for seemingly approaching a disaster. Do you think that the ICS, being that it's been around for quite a while, do yeah. you think that it needs to evolve with yeah. our rapidly changing geopolitical landscape? Yes, I do. And 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 so part of the, you know my explanation of ICS is just to say to the outside world, disasters look like they're, you know, horrible and random and there's no there actually is a rhythm as you know there's a there's a there's a a, a battle rhythm and that is formed around the incident command system or structure uh, and it's a, that you know just to cut to the chase it's just a hierarchical system of which you have an incident commander who's driving logistics and planning and resources and and everything else that you're going to want in a disaster and 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 financials of course that you're going to want in a disaster and the beauty of ICS which came out of the firefighting field is it it has a plug and play aspect to it so uh uh, uh, uh your viewers will uh, no, often note, you know, like sometimes you'll hear, well, you know, 60 firefighters from Massachusetts are being deployed to California. Well, they don't have to get retrained. They're all trained in the same universal structure. So you could just plug and play them. You go, OK, 60 of you, you're going into this part of the incident command structure where you're dealing with logistics or you're dealing with firefighting uh, uh, in this area. So but I do think ICS has to expand because of the the continuing or change I wouldn't say we would throw it out, but modify to take into account all of the pressures that are put on disaster managers, right? I mean, in other words, there's politics and communications and 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 equity issues that really weren't considered in the much more formal objective aspects of ICS. And 
Uh, and when I say the pressure on the disaster management system, I mean, COVID's a perfect example. Hurricane Katrina was another, uh, you know, that the idea that disaster management needs to fix everything wrong with society, it's just, it's just asking too much. I mean, disasters uh, expose everything wrong with society, whether it's the inequities of the healthcare system or the corruption in a police department or whatever it is that, that unfolds during a disaster. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, ICS just doesn't have a capacity to take that into account. And so maybe we need to figure out ways in which we can address, in particular, the inequities that we see in how resources are distributed uh, uh, during a crisis. We, we know that now and we have to get better about addressing that. Communication is rapidly evolving each yeah. and every day. I know that you are a prolific tweeter and social media has become uh, yeah. both an incredible tool, but it, it also adds to the noise a little bit. D do you think yeah. that that is an issue when it comes to, uh, again, being now the boom occurs, we're now yeah. right of the boom. We're trying to get everybody on the same page with how to move forward. Do you think that it gets a little messy with social media? I would imagine that it can be a very powerful tool if used properly in your field. Right. It is, I, it is so, and I, th I think one is we have no option and two is uh, the only way to combat, we've learned this with, with vaccination, the only way to combat it, uh, the misinformation one is the social media platforms have to get smart, and they are. I, Twitter and other companies um, are, during disasters, as you certainly know, are trying to get the crap off because people need to know what to do. And so some guy who's saying, you know, some some crank who's saying X and actually reality is Y is, is something important that the social media platforms need to be responsible for. But the other, and this is where I think it's really important, is, as you know, we're not the most tech savvy field. Well, you guys are, but you know, your average emergency manager, your average, uh, uh, you know, small business owner may not feel comfortable in this world. And, and you just, it's, it's not acceptable anymore not to be comfortable in this world. You just have to be able to communicate in a way that people are actually communicating. And part of that is quantity. Uh, that I mean, I've discovered this when you said I'm a prolific tw a Twitter. I mean, part of it is you just, <laughs> you have to get your voice out there consistently and in a manner that engages people. So one of the things that I've noticed, which I think is really important, this has more less to do with climate and more to do say with a active shooter case is uh, police departments are getting better about saying immediately, we, even if they don't know what's going on, we understand or uh, you know are hearing of a shooting at, at school Y, we are deploying people there now. And they basically what it gives the public is a sense that, okay, well, someone is doing something because it's the silence, right? That 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 then breeds the 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 conspiracy and the anger and and the fear, right? It is the fear. I mean, most people just want to know what's going on. As I said, you know, they just want to know what, you know, numbers and hope. That's what the public wants. They want numbers, what's going on, and then hope. What are you doing to make tomorrow better? And it's amazing. The public will, um, uh, uh, and I've seen this with Republican governors during hurricanes. I've seen this with Democratic governors during COVID. People will respond with that kind of honesty. So uh, that's what we need to continue to focus on, in particular, with things like climate where they can be very long, you know, they, 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 it's not, it's like an earthquake happens, a terror attack happens, and then it ends. Like, you know, we're, we're dealing with uh, disasters that unfold slow, sometimes unfold slowly and have impacts for weeks of months, if not years. I mean, we have, as you know, when there's, there's school districts in, in, in uh, places that were hit by the tornadoes a couple months ago, that are still doing remote learning because they can't build the schools fast enough. It truly is wild to read some of the, the passages that you have in your book. One that really stood out to me was when you were talking about the Challenger shuttle disaster yeah. and the quote being one of the most studied disasters for how an entire institution, well aware of the risks ahead, let ego and politics silence the warning signs. Yeah. So for someone like yourself that has worked on the inside, so to speak, is that a concern that, yeah. that politics and ego are getting in the way of, of literally saving human lives? 
Right. That was 1986. Yeah, so it was. So people, you know, and and I'm I'm very, you know, if there's any criticism I fear about the book is I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a woe is me writer. I'm not a blamer. You know, I mean, I, you know, I criticize institutions, but, um, but to me, that's like, you know, okay, there's greedy people, there's whatever. I mean, a part of it is sort of accepting that that's true too, right? And the, how, how do you minimize the harm that may come from that? So, and I'm, I'm also pretty forgiving of high risk industries. I don't, you know, I, I'm, you know, nuclear facilities, offshore drilling, uh, air travel, all of these things are inherently risky. And you can't talk about no risk when you talk about, or, or space travel, when you talk about these high risk, uh, 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 adventure, so to speak, or high risk uh, uh, companies. And so the space shuttle, you know, many people will think, many people think of it, oh, it, it blew up spectacularly. Well, the studies actually show uh, now in a very study that, that there's a lot of reasons I come back to the space shuttle, but the one that you're focused on is, is uh, the O-ring. The O-ring is literally, you know, no bigger than my room. Uh, it was um, a, a, a contractor noticed very famous story a contractor noticed that in colder weathers the o-ring was was contracting and expanding in ways that would probably have destabilized he ref, uh, the shuttle he refused to sign off on the final you know checklist before the space shuttle challenger went off uh, his company he was a contractor uh, then um, uh, um, uh, overruled him, signed it, and he he's watching what he knows is going to happen. I mean, he 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 talks about it later in his life, uh, uh, in, in in his life. So so the O ring is is a warning sign, right? And people are warning, and so leaders need to be, I say, get your head around it. Leaders need to be in a headspace of right side of the boom. In other words, what happens is institutions think they've put so much into prevention, protection, we're going to do everything again, that they're, they're not thinking through, well, what, what, if my, you know, what if my last line of defense actually is not a last line of defense? What if the O-ring uh, 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 can't withstand uh, weather? And people knew it on the inside. There's actually many reasons for the space shuttle, which I get into later in the book. And I think what's really important for institutions, and in, in, in particular leaders in either government or business or or any or or family, is is to let your head, either get your head around, let your head go to that bad space because honestly, it's gonna, it's like it could happen anyway. So there's no point in not thinking about it. But it's the thinking through that will then force you to address either the, 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 the O-ring failure or other failures that might be able to be uh, to stop a major disaster. And so, you know, part of it, it's like a wake up call, like, you know, we, we can no longer think we can build and wish and, 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 uh, and defend ourselves against harm. So we've chatted about the inside, but to bring it back full circle here, to bring it back to Jane in Joplin, Missouri, and her guiding yeah. principle that inspired the title of the book. Again, the devil never sleeps, but he only yeah. wins if we don't do better next time. When you say we, we talked about the politicians yeah. and the, the, the decision makers, the lawmakers, but what can we, the, the yeah. general public, do on that right side of the boom That's to great. make it better for when the devil inevitably comes back again? Yeah. No, I'm so glad you said that. And um, um, because the last chapter is real, is the the last chapter is okay. What now? It's like okay, okay. Now you've told us these common errors and what we can do to fix them. But what do I do? So for individuals, right? I mean, it is. I mean, a couple things. I guess I would say. So the first is to get risk elimination out of your standard, right? As a parent, as a small business owner, as just how you live your life in your community. And what your goal is, is to minimize the risks as much as possible, left side of the boom, but also prepare for what could happen um, on, the, on the right side of the boom. And the same advice that I would give to NASA or a major retailer or any other number of clients that I have, um, or, uh, is the same advice I give to uh, the average person, given the threats that they face. So uh, the three that I focus on is is you know you know 
what kind of investments have you made? Investments, not just money, but thinking through what is my response? What is my uh, 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 um, preparedness capabilities? I mean, in other words, so, and it's it's basic stuff. It is, it is if I live, it, it, people who live in Florida, you already are doing this, hopefully. You know, what, do I have redundancies in the system? Do I have backup plans? Can I stop what I call in the book cascading losses, uh, which is uh, even if the bad thing happens, how do I make sure worse things don't happen? So an easy answer to that is if your kid has medications, right, better, you got to build, you know, sort of, you want to make sure that that kid doesn't get sicker uh, in terms of, of, uh, of your investments in planning. The second is to think about, as I said, where are you, uh, no, uh, where's the money? Uh, how are you built? A uh, big theme of the book is I believe a lot of safety and preparedness challenges come by design, that we've designed ourselves, even families and, and individuals, in ways that, that uh, for preparedness that, that don't make much sense. So, um, and once again, I learn from what people do. So think about you know, phone trees that exist for people who live in California, ways to be able to, to contact each other and thinking about um, you know, does does all your preparedness capacity reside in one person, right? That may not be the best thing. Uh, or have you prepared your kids as we've been preparing them now for the pandemic? Uh, and then the third is, you know, where are you? I, I, I'm a big, I, you know, I, I, I have great confidence in the American public that they can handle the truth, even in a world of disinformation and even in a world that would wish all this stuff away. Uh, but, you know, it, it is is to be prepared uh, and to do all the investments of preparedness that I talk about in the book, unity of effort, being able to communicate, situation what is what's going on on an individual or institutional level uh, requires accepting uh, that, that you can still be successful even when the bad thing has happened. So uh, that's the kind of, those are the kind of lessons that, uh, that I, um, that I, that, that apply to, to, to the CEO or the parent. Um, and I guess, you know, to end this, I guess it does, if I were to think about one, you know, what's your takeaway, it may just be in the title, which is the, that, that, uh, that we can no longer view success as, uh, as, as stopping all bad things from happening. We, we can view success as, as whether we minimize the harms once the bad thing comes, and how, and what what are the commonalities across centuries of disasters? I think the oldest one is the Trojan horse example. How do we uh, how do we learn those commonalities uh, and 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 be able to uh, uh, to act on them? Juliet, it's a pleasure to speak with you always. The book oh. was just incredible from the story at the beginning to, I mean, again, we, you talked about the blackout and the Super Bowl in 2013 to the Beyonce. Walking Dead to Chipotle. <laughs> there's something in there for everybody. Yeah, there's there something is. in there for everybody. I, I have to say, it's like, you know, if, if Trojan horses, Churchill or Beyonce is your thing, I've got something for you. But um, uh, but it, <laughs> it's, it's a book that is intended for audiences like yours, people who, who care about what's happening to uh, the world and worry, um, uh, and just need some, just need to be told what does it mean to have agency, uh, and what can I do? Again, the book coming out this March, the 29th on Amazon and across all major publishers and booksellers, The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Juliet, again, it was a pleasure Thanks. to speak got, with you. I, I really appreciate it. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Um, Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been it's so great working with you all and everything that's that's being done there to to prepare people. That's all we can do. I, 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 I hope to mitigate some of the challenges or harms of the climate uh, changes and disasters we're seeing them. But in the meanwhile, there's still a lot that we can do. So I'm not the most creative person in the world, but I had an idea of 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 the sort of um, 
boldness of the cover, but I didn't know how to describe it. And then um, the maybe the most fun part of writing the book uh, was uh, being with my publisher of public affairs has a graphic designer, book cover designer, a guy named Peter Garceau, who uh, if you, G-A-R-C-E-A-U, if you look at his website, he's done a lot of big books uh, and famous books. And he read the book or read at least what it was, uh, early versions of it, and really did think that that idea of of multiple different kinds of disasters uh, in a way that sort of pops out at you, uh, has a sort of fill of a thriller, uh, which I think is great. Uh, you know, all that's missing is the love story in the in the book, and uh, um, and really grateful for him because it is it's a kind of book that you're like, okay, I feel like I could handle this book, right? It seems familiar, uh, um, and so it's really yeah, I I couldn't have been happier. So it's a fire cyber and then a pandemic another uh, a quick quick little lightning round of questions for yeah. you here as well Juliet if you if you have some time here we have some questions from some folks that asked us on social media that I wanted to, to run oh, past good. it here um, so first question for you are there actually more disasters or are we simply inundated with news about them more and more so there are both uh, so at all of the above. So there are more disasters and the, the difference is also they're bigger. So if you just look at multi, if you look at uh, disasters that are over a billion dollars in harm, uh, some of that has to do with the way we built so that the harms, you know, increase and, and the price tag increases. But we are at, you know, we are at a couple dozen billion dollar disasters, I think a year now, which is like, was like unheard of even 10 years ago. But then the frequency of the kinds of harms that are both small, so they may be a crisis for a community, flooding in Kentucky, uh, a tornado in a small town, they're a crisis, they're not national in scope, but those are also increasing in frequency. And, and you know, I, I, I you know, the, the political debates, I definitely have strong political opinions, but the political debates I leave for others in the book, all I'm doing is taking the world as it is and saying, okay, if it is this way, what can we do better knowing that they're, that they're, they're more frequent and they're bigger? Next question here for you from social media. How yeah. critical is the food shortage for our yeah. population growth going to be over the next five years? This is so interesting. So I don't have the exact numbers in, in front of me, but um, it's such a good question because it links climate change to the security threat that most of us in national security view it. This is not just an environmental threat to our planet and to us and to animals and to and to and to plants. It is it is also a security threat because the food shortages and I'll start outside of the United States, the food shortages, the the, the deprivation of basic resources to populations because of climate change is when two things happen. Conflict, because people are fighting over limited resources, so that's your national security frame, and migration. And we have talked about, you know, in, in the series, we have talked about, you know, climate refugees, that this is the new wave, the UN recognizes climate refugees, the United States, does, it's not actually part of the way we think about what a refugee is, but when people move and they move in mass, that also creates creates security threats. So, uh, so it's that it's the food insecurity that we really have to view not just through the lens of of environmental issues, but also through the lens, exactly as you said, through security issues. So I know that Juliet, you're you're a big macro person when it comes to looking at the disaster and risk management. But to take it really micro here yeah. from from this last question from social media, what are five items that are never really discussed for go bags or an emergency okay. kit that should be considered? Okay, so that's such a good that's such a good question. So um, and I'm gonna and maybe they have been, um, but let me just go through like this is such a great question. Like the things that that if I could tell people. What do you want? Okay, and some of this may be basic to the writer. So we always talk about water. I know that's crazy to say this, but, pe but people don't know what that means. So here's, here's the easy translation. One gallon per person per day for three days, right? If things are worse than three days, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. You're in bigger trouble than maybe you can. So thinking about my family, I have five or I had five in the house. I got some in college now, right? So 15 gallons of water. Okay, now all of a sudden, as I said, we have agency. We know how to do this. 
Uh, the second is uh, redundant glasses. This is the one thing that I always think is surprising. Just assume you're in an earthquake and something happens to, or you can't find your glasses. Seeing is, is actually uh, 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 essential. In your go bag, I would not recommend this, but you're just going to want access to some energy supply, uh, uh, either for your car. So those of us in the field, I'm, you know, I start to like get into a sweat if my gas tank is like lower than a third. My family laughs at me. That's probably my own crazy. Me too. You, <laughs> me I too. Know, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to get somewhere if you um, have to get somewhere. Here's the fourth, and it does not require uh, doing anything. It requires thinking numbers, right? So we are now so focused on these things uh, being our only access, right? Well, these things may not work. I should be careful. These things may not work uh, uh, in a disaster, right? So you want to be able to figure out numbers in terms of what are addresses where you might meet or other things. So if you cannot communicate for some period of time, the idea that you can just call may not be true uh, uh, for um for yourself. And then the fifth, I'll have fun with this one. Um, everyone has their thing. So either whether it's a stay home bag or a go bag, everyone has their thing that just makes life better. I'm not going to condone drinking or cigarette smoking, but, but, you know, if you think you're going to be home for a couple of days, what are the things that will just as the parent or the, the owner of house will make your life uh, just a little bit better. That's what we want. So, so there's a, uh, Twizzlers in my house because that makes mom happy. Uh, but uh, hidden, uh, there's other things, of course. I'm a big fan of cash because uh, I do worry about access to cash, so I do have cash hidden uh, in my uh, in my go bag. And the only other thing is just your your comfortable shoes. It is just a, a little, chances are if you have the ability to do it, you're going to do a lot of good simply by having comfortable shoes and taking care of yourself. So, you know, just walking away sometimes. That's the best disaster management I know of. Yes, of course. So, Juliet, thank you so much again for joining us. Okay. For any of the, those of you that are watching, be sure to follow us across our suite of social media platforms. They are listed on the screen there. You will surely be seeing more of Juliet with our Climate Refugee series, as she, as she touched on. We are so excited to get back to that. And, of course, there's so much great content coming across the My Radar universe, so to speak, for Juliet and myself. Have a great day, everybody out there, and stay safe. Thank you. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.